The history of sustainability is, is quite lengthy alongside traditional financial reporting. It's not as long as financial reporting, but it, it's set alongside traditional statutory reports for, for the longest time. But in recent history, the focus has been mainly on the greenhouse gas topic, um, monitoring, measuring, and disclosing greenhouse gas emissions as part of sustainability reporting. And at, at one time, it was the core of sustainability reporting, so that policymakers could begin to understand what the emissions levels were like. And this is this is off the back of a fair amount of um, you know, public discussion um, about G GHG emissions disclosures and what those disclosures might lead to in terms of policy developments, including um, levying of carbon taxes and et cetera, to create the incentive to reduce emissions after the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Protocol before it. So the focus initially was really just on the greenhouse gas reporting, but there was a, a very large uh, group, a, a large population of voluntary additional non-financial reporting and supplementary disclosures that addressed the business entity's key sustainability priorities in other areas, the E, the S, and the G. Um, I've got some of those listed on the left-hand side of my slide. For example, the Natural Capital Protocol, which follows natural capital accounting, has a long history as well. The Carbon and Water Disclosure Projects. Also, our own national law regulation on environmental remediation obligations, largely through financially provision that sits in law anyway, in countries like South Africa with large mining sectors. Um, and then the social capital protocol, et cetera, SASB standards, GRI standards, the UN Global Compact, and the, the SDGs and equator principles. So quite a lot, you know, they call this the alphabet soup, quite a lot of, of sustainability reporting frameworks that have pre-existed where we are today. And thank goodness that they were there because, um, you know, we would never have gotten from A to Z in one, in one leap. It has certainly been an evolution. But the main sustainability reporting frameworks and standards that have been developing in this interim here have been um, focused on material, materiality assessments. The reason for that is unlike the RFRS framework where everything um, in the framework tells you, you know, by default what material is, what is material, there's an overlay of judgment over that, but the framework itself tells you what's material for financial reporting. And that was never the case with sustainability reporting. So it's always been underpinned by materiality assessments in order to present a, um, an, an attempt at an objective view of what the organization's most important sustainability priorities have been and are. Um, it's also had a, a wider stakeholder focus than just the investor focus you see in financial reporting. So a large broad stakeholder focus and um, also underpinned by an element of stakeholder reporting activism. Um, you know, all sorts of stakeholder groupings out there demanding more information that suited their own you know, specific ES and G priorities, human capital, social capital, and natural capital. So quite a lot of activism around the content of that sustainability reporting. And then also large NGOs like the United Nations and the World Economic Forum, uh, you know, among the key players mobilizing awareness and support across the economic and governance landscape to give momentum to this thing called sustainability reporting which is quite amorphous because it, it contains a whole lot in that box. Um, also, you know, it's great to see Mervyn on the call um, because he did so much uh, with the Int uh, Integrated Reporting Council, the Global uh, Integrated Reporting C uh, Council, <laughs> to ensure that we had an integrated rep reporting framework to yeah. house and to serve as a home um, for some of this integrated reporting that included sustainability or material sustainability information. And that has now itself morphed into the Integrated Reporting and Connectivity Council um, housed within the IFRS Foundation. So we've come a long way. You know, if we look at what happened before where we are now, it's been a long time um, and, and a very active field of players and, and initiatives. But of course, it was when the TCFD framework, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, when they, they started their work in 2017 and 18, that was at the back of a big wake up call um, to the investor community when they started to realize that a lot of the investment portfolios with um, you know, asset holdings that essentially had holes in their bucket because they couldn't estimate the, the impact of climate risk in those investment portfolios that had high emissions exposures, high climate risk exposures. Uh, it was a big wake up call for the investment community and they began to want, they begin to want that information as opposed to saying, well, I see it, but I don't know how I'm going to use it. So that was the wake up call when investors said, we actually know this, this information is relevant to our valuations and to our financial information as well. And then regulators followed suit. So you might say that in the last three years, really, it's been maybe three to five years um, off the back of all these wonderful initiatives and King 4 in South Africa as well, which was ESG focused. Um, all these initiatives have led to where we are now. And we've been able to walk through the door of having 
brand shiny new standards in the form of the ISD standards and the SRSs, just because of all the work that was done before. Um, most recently, of course, at the back of the TCFD developments, we've also got the focus on the task force for nature-based financial disclosures, the TNFT disclosures, mm -hmm. and they've just come out in version four. On the 18th of September, we have a brand new framework for disclosing biodiversity-related financial information as well as climate. So I know that the session is focused on climate, so we won't go there, but it's really just to show you that this momentum is ongoing, it's not going to stop. In fact, we've got a tiger by the tail, it's running fast, and we're all going to have to hang on because it's going to be a while back. Okay, so um, just looking at some of the work that was done in policy making then. Um, so what we've got now is what they call the inevitable policy response. There were all these civil society and NGO actions going on, and everyone referred to what would be the inevitable policy response. Sooner or later, policy would have to catch up with what was going on in the stakeholder groups and out there in the big world of business and sustainability. Uh, the King Four, King Four Code came out and emphasized the idea of responsible business, being a good corporate citizen and inclusive capitalism. And all of those ideas and concepts really took hold at the back of the global movement that said this is good and this is the direction we should be going in. So policymakers had to start thinking about what they were going to do about all this. And so we did see, hello, do you come inside? You're welcome. Um, we, we did see market regulators and stock exchanges especially stepping up um, as they realized that investors did actually like and want to use this information for valuations and other things. Um, also, more recently, we've had investment market regulators and prudential regulators stepping into the scene as um, global reserve banks and um, uh, uh, central banks have realized that climate change in particular is a systemic risk. And will it uh, affect financial stability and therefore it needs to be regulated and monitored on an ongoing basis? And the South African Reserve Bank and the PA have been active in this space as well, um, you know, joining the, the international community of global regulators to bring um, appropriate policy to South Africa aligned to the global movements in those areas. Also, national and regional governments have moved away from just looking at emissions target reductions, which was the original movement under Kyoto and Paris, and now actually looking to net zero targets in some, in some cases. There are probably around 20 countries, I think, that have set themselves net zero targets, moving beyond the idea of having nationally <coughs> determined contributions or NDCs under Paris and saying, but now that we've looked at all this, we know that we've got to go to net zero. It's not enough just to reduce emissions. We're never going to get to um, the better of global warming. So some countries with the wherewithal to be able to do this have actually said, let's go to net zero. For example, the United Kingdom, Japan, and a few others. Um, and that's uh, the European Union as well. So these are leading voices. Um, they have the most extensive national and, re and regional um, level policy frameworks in place to address sustainability and ESG priorities, um, being those environmental and social factors that they view for their countries and jurisdictions as the most pressing and important to sustain healthy and rob robust investment markets and their economies and trading environments. So pretty much that's a very quick whistle stop tour of where we came from in sustainability reporting with the back of a huge amount of underlying activity that sustained the sustainability provision for many years, uh, 20 years or more, maybe longer than that, I'm just guessing. And then off the back of that development of policy frameworks and um, standards, as um, standard setters and policy makers began to see that this is real, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not a story, it's actually real and it's, ha it's happening in our trading environments. So what actually then happened in South Africa? Sorry, well, Joan, can uh, I interrupt quickly? Um, I'm just behind you on slides uh which slide and you just to tell me which slides to move on to thanks the south africa southern africa slide i don't have my numbers it's the one here yeah, there we go yeah thank you so um looking at south africa's policy environment more recently um we had the presidential committee on climate change start up in 2020 um under sir run the president um and then sustained by national treasury initiatives to drive policy on development of a sustainable low carbon economy in South Africa and to de deliver on our climate pledges. By the way, just like many other countries, South Africa is way behind on our climate pledges and that gets highlighted very often by civil, uh, civil action groups and civil society groups that tell all the laggards, you're not doing enough here and you're never gonna make the targets. So think about that and speed it up. So, we have this presidential committee on climate change, which has been doing, um, you know, various, um, various, um, I suppose, convening of groups um, who who can change things and have a say in this. Uh, focusing on the just transition framework for South Africa, a just energy transition for South Africa, and underpinning that climate finance arrangements for South Africa. 
And of course, the banking sector and the insurance sectors have been very big players in this space. Um, and needless to say that the mining and minerals communities have for the longest time been at the head of all of these sustainability initiatives anyway, um, on account of the nature of their business. So you might say we have a very live civil action grouping, civil action movement in South Africa, underpinning where we are now and underpinning, underpinning the idea that we need to reduce, not only reduce emissions, but do better than that. In the terms of the regulatory sure. guidance, yeah. Are you able to just go a little bit slower? Slower, yes. Okay. For people of my age. <laughs> I'll certainly, well, it's, my, it's always my duty to I'll go slower. Thank you. Um, on the regulatory guidance side, we've had most recently now, um, the Prudential Authority here in South Africa has issued the draft proposed guidance notes, four of them, for banks and insurers to help them create their own um, uh, disclosure regimes aligned to global expectations. So this is saying, our Prudential Authority is saying, you know, good, you've been doing great so far, but now we need to align it all under a system of disclosure that is specific to banks and insurers, that also speaks to the Prudential Authority's own key priorities for the financial system in South Africa. So that's just happened now, and it's still in draft. Um, I suppose it'll be finalized before the end of the year, hopefully. Um, and then we've also had the JSE in 2022 issued their sustainability disclosure and climate disclosure guidance notes. And that was stepping into a void because um, many businesses and many civil action groups were saying, why are we so quiet in South Africa? Why can't we say something ourselves about what the expectations are and about displacing climate risk in our financial segments and as part of our market regulation regime? So that was because that was a voice in the void because people were frustrated that there was nothing being said about this for to guide this companies in South Africa. So the JSE came and did that in 2022. And of course, everyone seemed to be Forget for a while that we actually had a whole lot of existing regulation and disclosure that actually did catch climate risk disclosure anyways. And that you know, that was in the form of the existing King 4 code, um, which has been around for a, a long time and everyone thoroughly understands. And so it was always there as a reference for this type of disclosure. And this type of transparency was always there, including that we had the integrated reporting framework and guidance for the South African, you know, that South Africa has been a leader in the integrated reporting space. And we had lots and lots of guidance on you know, how to decide for yourself, how to um, you know, ensure that you are reporting always to your stakeholders on the most important things uh, to the business and to your stakeholders. The integrated reporting framework carried that, um, that banner um, and therefore was also equally applicable to climate disclosure and anything else that falls under the sustainability banner. And then lastly, we had the existing IFRS reporting standards, which have been in South Africa for the longest time. And that also, strictly speaking, if you read them carefully and apply them carefully, will tell you that you have to disclose climate risk type um, impacts on the financial statements already under IFRS. But all of this was a bit deep, too deep down, it was a bit too far under. And so we needed to surface some more prominent guidance um, for um, our companies here in South Africa. So you might say we haven't done too badly. Um, we're nothing compared to Europe or UK or some of the European countries in terms of the level of activity around policy making and standards. But we've been very good uptakers of good standards when they've been promulgated. And we've had some very good leader, leadership from South Africa, King Code and Integrated Reporting, and a few, a good a few other cases that I mentioned, where we've actually stepped forward and said that we can meet in this space and, and exercise our voice in the global south, as they call it these days. So that's really just a tour of where we are now, um, what's led up to now. And we, we're, in, you know, we're in a good space, essentially, although there's a lot to be done. So what we're facing now are two shiny new sets of standards that have hit the decks. Um, in June this year, we had the IFRS Foundation's ISB board, uh, International Sustainability Standards Board, a newly minted board created in 2021 um, with the specific task of creating a set of sustainability standards that the entire world could wear. Um, you might say there were so many um, fish in the pond, there were so many groups out there that thought they had the clear answer to sustainability reporting that it all needs to be marshaled under one global umbrella. And um, Mervyn was at the heart of this, so he knows the whole story, and I'm just tipping the iceberg. But the fact is that um, everyone came together and said, yes, we've got to do this. We've got to bring something that is one menu item versus 100 menu items into the uh, reporting um, domain so that people can pick it up and say, I'm clear on what I need to do, at least for this part of things. And so in this case, um, the ISB has worked very hard and very quickly, um, actually, to ensure that we have these two new standards available to work with. It, they're only the first two in a series that will come. 
uh, the ISB just had to create a prioritization sort of approach to doing this. And because climate has been so very important to everyone, and everyone can see that, that we're in a, a world of depleted biodiversity and very strong and dangerous climate change effects, um, it has received priority above everything else to do the climate change standard um, IFRS S2. And then, of course, IFRS S1 is, is, is there as almost the, um, the foundation to ensure that as we apply S2 and the other S3, 4, 5 mm -hmm. that will come behind it, that we have um, a sort of a generic generic basis, and you might say the plank, the foundation for reporting is there in IFRS S1. These standards are actually going to take effect um, at least at global level very soon. They're meant to be applied for annual reporting periods beginning on or after 1 January 2024. In other words, everyone is heatedly preparing for application of those standards right now. Um, because as you can imagine, in listed markets and in capital markets, investors don't like modifications, they don't like uncertainty, and, and they will more than likely react to information that seems wobbly or that um, you know warrants an auditor qualification or modification or something like that because it's not necessarily verifiable. So everyone's rushing to make sure that we can at least work with S1 and S2. Um, of course, here in South Africa and other countries like ours, we don't, you know, the, the SBE standard isn't a regulator, and therefore they have no power to enforce these standards. And so it's up to the national accounting standards agency in every country to look at S1 and S2 and say, we're ready to adopt those standards in our country, South Africa. And that is very likely in South Africa because we've always adopted global standards like IFRS and others. And so there's no doubt in anyone's mind that we will adopt IFRS S1 and S2 in South Africa. The question is what the time frame of that will be so that everyone can align and um, pick up the standards and use them here. So it, it, it may or may not be the same time frame. Um, they are intended to be applied within the scope of the integrated framework that currently exists. So um, the big question is where do all these disclosures now go? <laughs> and if you're a regulator, you say, well, they've all got to be in one report because investors, um, first of all, want all the material information in one place. They don't want to have to go and hunt for it everywhere. And secondly, um, the uh, most material information is it is connected. It's not. It doesn't stand alone. So all of this material information should speak to the rest of it in one report. And that's why most regulators around the globe are saying all of this information, which is material and does have financial impact, needs to be in the one annual report that you produce for investors and other stakeholders in an annual reporting period. So that looks like the direction of travel for climate change um, disclosures. However, when we get to other sustainability disclosures, uh, whether it be about human capital, social capital, those sorts of sustainability disclosures may still um, exist in other, in other reports or reports that fall under, you might say, a suite of reports that's headed up by the integrated report store, as we know. So it's, a, it's sort of a moving space on where all these disclosures are going to go. But at, as a minimum, all the financially relevant or financially impactful material disclosures about material matters need to go in the one annual report. And it, it, this is a clear emerging request from regulators to their regulated entities that um, they adhere to that. And I suppose there was a um, sort of a, a conversation going on about this at regulatory level, especially in the UK, where a lot of climate disclosures were happening outside of the annual reports. And the problem was, you know, first of all, uh, do they speak to each other at all or are they completely disassociated disclosures? And this was a real concern for the regulator because it meant that those disclosures weren't as effective as they could be. If they were in one place and there's a bit of honesty check in that as well for the report to two good so um the focus is on climate from the ESB's point of view um i'll just pause here for a minute and see carolyn is it is there any question or anything that i need to just pause on for the moment i realize i have gone maybe a little bit fast that's a terrible thing but we'll see if anyone just wants to stop and pause or interject or say something even in this room here um if you would like to make a comment uh, from my side online, uh, we are answering a couple of questions about uh, how are the standards adopted uh, in South Africa. So I've just put in there the FRSC, a little bit about that, that it's appointed by the Department of Trade and Industry, and currently the chair is Dr. Len Konar. Um, I've put the link in the chat function um, to that, uh, the FRSC, and I've also put the links to the um, the various the the if uh, the IFRS S one S two standards, I will make those available together with this presentation slide deck 
uh, on the website when I publish the uh, the recording of the event. But otherwise, um, nothing else from our side. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Of course, the big bang part in the development of IFRS is too was whether or not um, it would become mandatory or be made mandatory to report the scope three emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, in you know sooner or later in the scheme of things. And um, just pretty much on the uh, last set of revisions, uh, the ESB decided that the scope three emissions, which are very hard to calculate and challenging, and the methodology is not always entirely clear to everyone, uh, those scope three GHG emissions are going to be. Um, um, you can dispose them if you want them, and if you feel that you're on top of it all, you can make those disclosures. However, there is a uh, temporary relief for one year uh, to allow companies to get their heads around the ST reporting anyways, um, and at the same time, uh, brush up their ability to um, properly and um, reliably report the scope three emissions. Um, and of course, the concern among the director communities and everyone else was that if you put out a number of scope three emissions in your annual reports, and because they're high estimations and there's a lot of uncertainty in them at the moment anyway, uh, the, the concern was that um, investors, especially in more litigious environments, would begin yeah. to sue companies and directors for misleading, false and misleading information. Joanne, would you like to just unpack? What scope three emissions are in terms of what you, yes. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the measurement and recording of greenhouse gas emissions, that term green, greenhouse gases um is a is a group of uh, uh gases and it's not just one, it includes carbon and others. Um so it's a it's a parcel of greenhouse gases which are considered the most harmful to the environment and to the atmosphere, including methane, etc. So that package of greenhouse gases has to be um made in terms of what activities in our organization are driving the greenhouse gases and what emissions do we then cause from those activities so that we report them. So there's scope one and scope two and scope three. And the scope three emissions are problematic because they are the ones that you don't necessarily control yourself. In the scope one and scope two emissions scenarios, you do have direct or indirect control over how those emissions um, take place or are generated. And you can moderate your activity to de decrease those emissions with some investments and changes, of course. But in the case of the scope three emissions, these are the emissions associated with your upstream and your downstream activities through your supply chain or value chain. In other words, you have to know if, if Mark and I are in a supply chain relationship, I need to know what his emissions are, and he needs to know mine because I'm downstream to, stream to him. And of course, his upstream supplier needs to know his emissions and so on. So it's a chain of, a chain of of information and data that needs to be generated equally reliably across everyone in the supply chain. Now, as you can well imagine, supply chains are complex organisms. You have some large organizations and you have some small organizations typically in supply chains. And you'll often find that the smaller um, parts of the supply chain, is most especially, are not always well equipped to do a complex scope three estimation um, for their their, ups, their own upstream and down, downstream supply chains. So it's, it's very not like financial reporting where you have a boundary, your financial reporting says this is our organizational boundary. It's, it's the group of companies that comprises a parent and two subsidiaries. And that is a closed group of entities that you can measure for any attribute. Whereas in, yeah. Just to add to that, the additional complexity, if you look at the, the definition broadly of the global north and the global south, where global north is the um, the advanced economies in a sense global north are buying product from global south global south a big factor in global south is supplying the global north and therefore we are subjected to in the global south this whole phenomenon of supply chain uh, scope three emissions so it really does uh, it, it it affects us very very deeply in terms of how Global business works. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, thanks for that pause, Mark. That was really good. Um, so, the scope three emissions are the Achilles heel of the whole show. And while we know that there's a lot of science and methodology and professional expertise going into developing <clears throat> methodologies that can deal with the inherent uncertainty in estimating scope three emissions, um, at the same time, reporters and directors are saying that if we put our heads into the lion's jaws here, and go and report these scope three emissions on our best endeavors. Um, someone out there might say, well, that wasn't good enough for me, and I'm going to see you for loss of value in a securities transaction or something like that. So it's understandable in a way that the market had low appetite 
for making disclosures that look like this, because certainly no regulator was going to, in terms of exercising their regulatory responsibility, no regulator was going to say, don't worry, we'll give you a breather on that. Um, even if they do that informally, they would never do it formally. And so the issue is just allowing uh, companies and reporters to have enough time to estimate scope three with a, a modicum of reliability so that they can hand on heart say that this is our best endeavor to estimate scope three. And of course, that will necessarily go with a whole lot of disclosure because when something is as uncertain as scope three emissions, you're going to have pages of disclosure that go around that so that everyone is in the picture that there's lots of uncertainty here. Um, so that's how it's going to go until everyone you know, gets better and can do this well. And that's just part of the evolution of our reporting. Um, Jane, so I just have a question here. And uh, the question is one of the biggest challenges we have universally is availability of this data. Um, is there any thinking around support to companies in conjunction with the development of the reporting standards? Yeah. I think this is where, in a way, a lot of reliance is being placed on professional consultants um, and also NGOs who are specializing. In other words, we're giving attention to this particular area and they're getting a lot of global funding as well. So I think the guidance that we will receive will get better and better. At the moment, essentially what we've got in a nutshell is a, a big estimation type scenario. Um, with lack of actual data, you use proxy data, to, um, which is essentially data that's reported on a, on a sector, a whole sector level. Um, from statistics returns, et cetera, there is data available, but it's not at the entity level, it's at the sector level. And so based on a whole lot of activity proxy measures, one can, um, it's highly, it's high estimation, one can actually create a, um, um, a, a form of estimation which you can rationalize, you can articulate. It's not always um, clear what the uh, range of variance is in those estimates. So, and this is all coming out in, in, methodologies, in methodologies that are being developed at the moment. Banks in particular, banks and insurers, because they are in the, um, in the line of fire for finance emissions, there's a whole lot of pressure on the banking sector about finance emissions. They in particular are saying, if we have to report the scope three finance emissions that we're supposedly financing, um, that's a big risk for us. Um, we could misreport it, um, even with the best endeavors. And so banks and financial institutions in particular are, are working with uh, scientists and um, all sorts of modeling expertise to get this as right as they can. But it will come out with hefty disclosure. Make no mistake, when scope three disclosures are made, they're going to be accompanied by long, you know, which is, is sort of counterproductive in a way. We don't want that, but we may have to live with it for a while. Uh, because no person's going to go out and not create a shield for themselves, their own disclosure of, of highly um, uncertain things. The, uh, the, the auditing of these um, scattered emissions will also be extremely challenging. So Jane, I know the folks... Sorry, I've got around... one. While, while I've got... Uh, Mark's going to ask the question, I'm going to launch the poll. Uh, and this poll is around the disclosure data. Um, I'm going to uh, launch it now. Um, and then... I'd like to see how... Yeah. Just Go a ahead. Ah. Sorry, in the room, we can't actually um, have you. Hang on, I'm just, I'm learning how to launch it. So let, let Mark carry on. What we will do is we'll ask you to read the question and just put your hand up and then we'll add, we'll manually adjust the poll. <laughs> but Mark, would you like to carry on while I learn how to do this? <laughs> Mark, what was it? So, uh, uh... I know that the, the focus is around uh, reporting and um, and regulatory matters, but uh, generally, as a generalization, scope three emissions globally appear to be significantly greater than scope one and scope two. So it is a very serious issue. Um, the problem of not being able to report on your emissions uh, is, uh, is, a, is a material threat to many business operations, global business operations. And there are many examples of countries, never mind large corporates, who have lost their markets globally from, from north selling in, uh, from south selling into north by virtue of the fact that they've been unable to measure and disclose their scope three emissions. And that has had a dramatic impact on the economies of a number of countries. So this really is a very serious risk to business and to the economy. 
That's quite right. Okay, we have the poll up. Here's the question. How risky are your sustainability disclosures? Is your data any of verified, generally trustworthy, adequate, patchy, or generally untrustworthy? <laughs> have a go. Um, if you were to imagine this from the perspective of your own entity, there's no, um, there is a recording, but we won't show it to any regulator. Um, what do you think? So far, I don't think you've got any responses, Carolyn. It's a tough question. I, I, I do have responses. I'm just waiting for um, the last responses to come in. Um, you give me a minute. Um, I'm yeah, at one minute 28. I think if we get 30 more seconds as people want to answer, and then I'll show you the results. In those 30 seconds, volunteer a couple of responses in the room here. <clears throat> They're adequate. Adequate. One adequate. Too adequate. I feel like generally. it's generally untrustworthy. Okay, and it's been a range of reasons. Okay, I'm going to uh, end the poll now. Um, thanks everyone for for participating, and I'm just going to share the results on the screen for everyone to have a look at. <clears throat> so we've got okay. fifty percent none is verified. None is generally trustworthy. We've got 50% is adequate, um, about 40% is patchy, and then generally untrustworthy is sitting at 13%. And based on what we had in the room, that trend would hold in our room here as well, Karen. So everyone is bordering adequate to below adequate. Um, reflecting the general um, concern uh, that these numbers aren't yet sufficiently reliable to be able to report to investors for investor decision making. And therefore, it's a big caveat enter on those disclosures. And that's a bit of a conundrum. On the other hand, when we were looking uh, during the exposure draft phase, when we were looking at this very thing, because 80% of the disclosures that any entity typically would have to report are scope three, more, more often than not, um, but in some cases, your scope three might be equivalent to the others, but for many ordinary retailers and uh, consumer goods type organizations, the eight, it's 80% 80 of your total emissions are scope three. So if you don't report those, um, we're not making much progress, are we? It may be doable. It makes things, may things more doable. It would make things easier for everyone, but it wouldn't be very effective because we'd have a very big poll in the actual disclosures among a group of listed companies in a sector or on a stock exchange. And so if no one does scope through, we, we don't really get very far. So I, I would like to just add into this that because we're in an early stage of this process of sustainability reporting, I venture to suggest that if we were to take this poll in a year's time, we would probably find there would be far more literacy and concern about the adequacy of our sustainability disclosures when we are confronted with uh, what we are, are having to meet in terms of global requirements. So it's early days and it would be an interesting thing to monitor. Building on the scope through conversation we've just Sorry. had though. Joan, I just see that you're not seeing the, the slide share. Are you seeing it on your side? I can see now from yes. last computer, we've got the results of that poll on the screen. Yes, no, but I, I'm busy sharing your slides now and I don't see it on your screen. I can see them. Yep, I, we can all see my slides, yes. Okay, great, thanks. Because I see behind you, it's still showing the, the polls. Oh, I see, there we go. That's oh, the there we go, done. great, thank you, all right. <laughs> Good, okay, at least you knew what to do, Mike. So the same issue, believe it or not, um, is Exactly the same issue with all the other sustainability disclosures. The question we really have to ask ourselves as boards and directors and management teams and executives is for any of these sustainability disclosures, even though we might get them done, are they useful? Are they going to be sufficiently reliable for use in investor or other stakeholders' decision making? And that's why the conversation we just had about scope three is actually about everything. Because if we don't pay attention and if we don't get systems and controls in that can cope with these disclosures, which are new, by the way, relatively new, if we don't get that level of attention on them, they're going to be all pretty and shiny, but not very useful to anyone. And so for that reason, um, in my mind anyway, 
the um, sustainability, the, the material sustainability disclosures that we intend to make to our stakeholder and investor communities need to be wrapped into the finance function. Now we get a lot of conversations and we're getting a bit of point here. We get a lot of conversation about whether you should have a chief sustainability officer or something between the sustainability officer and something else. And how should you do it so that at executive level companies will take responsibility? So that it's not buried, you know, three layers deep and no one really cares about that person's work or not because it's three layers deep. But once you bring it up to executive level, the question is which executive should wear the ultimate responsibility for the accuracy and reliability of these disclosures? Of course, it's the CFO mm -hmm. and the CEO because the CFO function, the finance function, has historically always held the mantle of the reporting, the guidance of reporting inside the organization to ensure that what goes out into the public domain is the information the organization does want to put out and that it's been checked internally through internal assurance, et cetera. So notwithstanding that you may invest quite sensibly in a sustainability function and a chief sustainability, sustainability officer, et cetera, when it comes to the actual reporting of that information to your external stakeholders, you absolutely do need it to be wrapped into the finance function. And I think there's a missing conversation there sometimes because people have long, you know, arguments about who it should be. And of course, it should always be a, a core CFO function. And of course, CFOs might run a mile to hear that because they've already got quite a lot on their plates and they don't necessarily want a whole swathe of new, you know, somewhat wobbly sustainability information coming through into their domain as well. But that's that's the trajectory. That's where it must go. So just a by the way, completely off the point. Um, in terms of what else has happened then, while the ISBE standard setters restrain themselves to two new standards and prioritize climate, um, the European standard setters, on the other hand, you know, had quite a, a big to do and off the back of a very big strategic initiative in Europe called the Green Deal, where Europe decided some years ago that it needed to transform the entire European economies into a low carbon or no carbon and more sustainable economy <laughs> for the benefit of all its inhabitants and for its longevity as an economic center. Um, the Green Deal was put into place with a swathe of um, policy making initiatives. And one of those was called the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, uh, which has tracked on now for quite a number of years. Um, and as part of that initiative, which was to say, was to decide from at a policy level, what should you be disclosing so that investors in the European markets can make better decisions and better capital allocation decisions and better trading decisions. Um, they decided they would, they would need a new suite of your, what they've called ESRS standards. And those standards have just been released as well in July 2023. Of course, it was bad news uh, back a few years ago when we, when we realized we'd have two competing standard setters putting our standards into the market, which you know, effectively are for global use um, or for widespread use. It seemed like a bad news story at the very beginning. However, and due to pressure from users of these standards, the, the standard setters have come together and made an attempt to make sure that we don't have two parallel sets of standards that ask for different things. And so the word interop interoperability has been used m more recently quite a lot to describe how standard setters have responsibly decided to talk to each other, the international standard setters, the European standard setters, and the GRI, which has already got a very big um, investment in global standards. The three bodies have, have spoken to each other quite well recently, although they certainly not haven't resolved everything and all the differences, but they have attempted to make sure that these standards don't run apart and that they are somewhat interoperable. There is a long way to go, but at least that sensible conversation has happened as well. Any questions, Mark? I see you're getting ready. No, no. Mm -hmm. cool. Okay, good. So in terms of what the Europeans have done then, they've put out 12 standards. Yes, go ahead, Raymond. Oh, I just want to ask, well, let's just give a couple of adjustments. CBAM, yeah. Carbon adjustment mechanism. So that's a slightly different um, piece of policy which uh, the Europeans started and which everyone else has replicated because it becomes apparent once you start to ask people to count their emissions that when, for example, when South Africa exports product into Europe, if we don't give um, our carbon description along with that product, they could be importing a whole lot of emissions um, attached to the product that we send into Europe, that they, they then have to almost deal with themselves from a, a cost impact point of view. So what the Europeans started saying they wanted to do was to make a pricing adjustment or a tax adjustment, it's essentially a tax on an importer, on imported goods into Europe to say, if you're going to not manage your emissions and just give us your product with all the emissions it has attached to it, then you're going to incur a penalty on your pricing in form of tax 
um, to allow that product to come into Europe with all those emissions associated. So there's a direct incentive <coughs> for importers of product into Europe, exporters of product into Europe and importers to make sure that their emissions are managed down so that they don't incur that penalty price and all taxes on the product. It's a big thing for the global south, <coughs> excuse me, because the more we don't care about our emissions, we don't care to measure or reduce them, the more we're going to be penalised on pricing and return return on you know trading profits um, because our product goes into Europe with a whole lot of emissions on it, or alternatively, it gets rejected because Europeans don't want product anymore with that level of emissions on it. They want something else. So I'll go to Oceania, Oceania markets or American markets and get an equivalent product or something to substitute with those emissions. So we're in that sort of really competitive trading space now. <clears throat> if we don't here in South Africa pay attention to this, our products will be marginalized um, in favor of other countries and other regions that do as well. And, and now what Europe has done has been applied also in the UK, in the Australian markets. It's it's everyone gets gets it and the sense of doing it. Good good question, thank you. So the um, besides the two cross-cutting ESRSs, which are about the general requirements for sustainability reporting in the European region, and also the general disclosure requirements, there are also 10 topical um, ESRSs, which are environmental, social, and governance. And funny enough, these reflect what, at least in the eyes of the Europeans, this reflects what they consider for the European markets to be the most important sustainability topics that need to be disclosed to um, stakeholders. And I've just given you some examples. One is business conduct, essentially ethics. Consumers and end users is one of the social topics. Affected communities is another. In others, reporting real sustainability data that you can um, define um, in terms of a reporting definition, measure with some objectivity, and then report faithfully to as part of the reporting. Environmental was climate pollution, water and marine resources, circular economy and resource use, and there were a couple of others. So the Europeans have actually gone so far as to say, we think these are the most important sustainability topics anyway. So we're going to say as a, um, what do they call it, a um, default position, report these, unless per your materiality assessments that you do yourselves, you are able to explain why any of these environmental standards are not applicable for your business. So for example, if you don't have um, a lot of water in your business or your supply chain, which is unthinkable, really, uh, or if somehow in your supply chain in your business, you have very little exposure to pollution, which is also somewhat unthinkable. So they're probably about right. But it does mean that if you're reporting under the European standards, you have a lot more work to do because the European regulators have told you that you must at least do these and do them in the way we say. And it's it's a fair amount of effort. It's very intensive to get ready to report ac across such a big swath of standards. Having said that, the Europeans have known this is coming for a long time. They've had at least five years' notice. And, and so you might say anyone who's, who's not, you know, who's left it till the last minute to get across this is probably their own goose. But at the same time, we see in the consultant market it's like a tidal wave of activity as people get ready for this reporting. And on the next slide, Carolyn, the reporting periods for it, thank you very much for um, putting that up. Um, in the um, the reporting timelines for the Europeans are also 2024 uh, for the 2025 annual report. So doing it next year for the 2024 trading period, financial year, or reporting in 2025. So we'll see these disclosures come through for both ISME and for the European markets in 2025. But you will have some leaders, some leading organizations that have been part of this effort for the longest time and can actually do it already and are doing it already. So we'll see some shining examples come through as well. And of course, that is really just for the companies that are already subject to the uh, reporting directive in Europe. And there are three other categories of reporters that will be caught by the EU standards. And those are the large privates. Um, so the large privates, which wouldn't ordinarily um, have this extent of disclosure because they're private, have been caught by this net as well. Uh, the third category is the listed small and medium ent entities in Europe and the small non-convex credit institutions. They've got a bit more leeway. They've got two years to get ready from here. And then lastly, the very important category is the third country companies with subsidiaries or branches in EU. So any country like ours, for example, that has a business presence in Europe, um, you don't actually have to have a subsidiary or branch in Europe to be caught by this. If you just have a, um, a, a business set up, you're doing business in Europe. And you have a certain uh, level of, of business turnover going into Europe or out of trading with Europe, you're caught by it and you, you become the third country company and you have to uh, adopt exactly the same disclosures. So there's a four layer disclosure regime. They're calling it a staggered reporting regime, but they're doing their own region first 
and they're catching the others in later. So if we have a company here in South Africa with a very large trading presence in Europe, and we do have many ca uh, companies that have such a trading presence, we um, will have to be, get ready as well to apply the US OSS. Even if you don't have a large trading presence in Europe, for example, let's just say you, do, you don't, you do some trading, but it's not big. To increase your market access and to increase your presence, you'd want to still be using the standards because otherwise, your supply in, in your supply chain, you're going to be marginalized because you don't have that information to provide as part of the supply chain. So strictly speaking, the regulation is the first line of does it apply to me or not? But you may want to do it anyway so that you can speak to European suppliers and have the same information sets as they usually would observe as part of establishing trade relationships, including with banks. Jen, I'm sorry, but we've got some yeah. power issues. Okay. So we may run into a yes. problem. All right, let's just hurry up then and say- I've got a quick question. Yeah. Um, what are the implications of the recent comments by the UK Prime Minister and pushback on the ban of the sale of new petrol vehicles and diesel cars in the UK, 2013 yeah, to 2015? Yeah. Yeah, if anyone else has a better way to answer this, go ahead. But I have my own thoughts, but I'll just first see if anyone else wants to dive in and respond on that one. Anyone in the room? <laughs> I think essentially, of course, you know, Richie Sinaki is the Prime Minister of England, he's a politician. And um, what is actually happening here is that the trickle down effect, if I can use that word, of all the policy initiatives, because UK has been very active and proactive in their policy making, and they've been very good at putting in some really solid policy design to lower carbon emissions. And that all makes good logical sense. But the rubber hits the road when suddenly um, a, an ordinary guy living in Brighton has, is going to be forced to replace his car because he can't anymore drive a petrol vehicle in Brighton streets without incurring heavy, what do they call them, levies, because you're driving a petrol fuel, a fuel, a petrol fuel car through the city center instead of an EV car. And of course, it's going to be problematic in terms of voter unrest, but also because right now the entire world, including the UK, is going through a cost of living crisis. Australia is, New Zealand is, UK is, many other countries are. Some of that's linked to the war in Ukraine, and some of it's just linked to all sorts of other disasters and issues. So cost of living um, in many developed countries has soared to the level where Asking this overlay of expense to go onto, you know, to put that onto the manual street has become a bit of an issue. 